the Irish Human Rights Commission come under the Irish Human Rights Commission Act, that's a government act, you know, there's a piece of legislation. The, the state has set them up because they were obliged actually to set them up under the Good Friday Agreement. So they're, they're legally mandated in the country to uphold human rights, to uphold the rights under the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and all the conventions <coughs> that Ireland has ratified, which includes the European Convention of Human Rights, mm -hmm. which is, is a law in itself in this country, the European Convention of Human Rights Act 2004. So, uh, um, so they, have to, they are legally mandated to point out to the government if there is deficiencies between human rights law and the constitution, or where there's any area uh, um, that there's issues on. And they have produced this huge report. The, the UN um, put great store by that. The, that has gone to the UN, and we, we quote from this to the UN. Because, uh, um, I'll just go into another area now in a minute. Uh, um, the UN always, uh, there's a human rights commission in most countries, or some sort of a body like that. But the United Nations puts great store by everything that they say, once they're legally mandated under the law uh, to uphold human rights. So they cannot be ignored in a way, you know? It's, it, it, when you get into kind of fighting this whole system, it, there's all different aspects and different ways to fight it. it and one of the ways is to use this, to use this as a lobby all the time to keep fighting it. And um, we have certainly used that. So that's what we do at the moment. Um, there's, uh, we, we, because our policy is based on human rights law, um, Atheist Ireland um, uh, makes submissions to the UN under the various uh, um, conventions. There's all different conventions. And we make submissions. And our, some one or two of our submissions are up on the UN website and things like that. And what we're pushing for is for the state to be found in breach of one of the conventions. In particular, um, there's a big convention um, now that the government have just reported on, which is the convention, the United Nations Convention on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. And the main education article is in that. The main education, the, the right to education is in that. And um, because the UN has uh, complained to the government four times over education and the various as aspects of discrimination, we are hoping that when um, the UN examine the state under this convention, that the, it will be found that the state is in breach of it. And that will start another ball rolling in the state. It's just another area where you keep putting pressure on. And, uh, and pressure from the outside um, does a lot. Can I just ask you there, do, yeah. do you think it's going to come down to a parent or a teacher or whatever taking a case, like an actual an Irish case, going to the European court? Yes. for the laws to change, or for something, you know, concrete to happen? Yes. Um, it's hard to know with that. And, and I have... The trouble with uh, taking a case to the European Court is that you have to go through the Irish um, legal system first. You have to exhaust, what they say, all domestic remedies. Now, to get through the Irish education, or the Irish the courts, it takes 10 years. It's just a nightmare. But there, it, there is parents, uh, um, uh, Wicklow parents, taking the state um, to court at the moment. But that could be years down the line. But, and there's no legal aid for these matters. So uh, um, you could lose mm. everything, uh, all your financial security. Of thousands, yeah. yeah. But I am in no doubt, and um, an awful lot of people um, on the ground that do a lot of research in this whole area, that... Irish constitution and laws are in breach of the European Convention of Human Rights. Now, there's no doubt about that there. It's staring us in the face. And um, the UN have already um, talked about, uh, uh, we, they call us those parents that are seeking secular education for their children. And they have said, uh, um, raise um, equality before the law, freedom from discrimination, freedom of conscience and the rights of the child. Those areas. Now, they are huge rights. Equality before the law. It's a basic right in a democratic state, and we haven't got those rights. And so is the right to freedom of conscience. It, 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 you know, there's a right to education, but it's linked into all other human rights, like equality before the law, freedom from discrimination, freedom of expression, the right to private and family life, all those whole areas. And, and the European Court links it all into those areas. So um, there's, there's a... a there's big cases at the European Court, and one big case in particular called uh, Fulgero versus Norway. Um, 
it came out in 2007. And um, when you get into the details, a huge case of all that case, it's just left in no doubt that Ireland is in breach of the European Convention on Human Rights in relation to education. And they are breaching our human rights under the European Convention and all the UN conventions. There, there, it's, just, it's just there. But there is a lot of research. There is people in Ireland doing research on all this. And, and uh, one person called, I have all that research, I can give you all that research as well, uh, Dr. Alison Mohini. And uh, she has uh, really good research. Out. And there's another guy in DCU uh, called Dr. Owen Daly. And he's really good. Now, he has got really some good research. On, and he's just released uh, his latest research on uh, enrolment policies, the Equal Status Act. And it's just out this month, and that is really good. And it's very important to have those pieces of research. Because, again, when you're heading to the UN uh, or the Council of Europe under the different conventions, they put great store by published uh, research, academic research. You know, you, you, we as an organisation could say, well, they're doing this and they're doing that in the education. This is what the state is doing. But if you have got something like this, an independent piece of research by the Irish Human Rights Commission, or you have an independent piece of research by Dr. Alison Mahini, that really backs up your case. And every research, published research that is out, backs up our case. That is really important. We're not getting into an argument here uh, with the state over... Um, whether we have those human rights. We bloody well don't have them. And all the research and the UN are now saying that we don't have them. We don't have these rights. So we're further along than sometimes a lot of people think we are. You know, but we can show clearly under each convention and each, and, and each case law, we can point out in particular what is happening uh, um, and where our rights are being breached. And we can do that now. And we have done that. And we are getting... Uh, moving that along, and um, because you lose the case under the Irish Constitution, you only can use Irish law on the Irish Constitution. So if you go off to the courts now, you can uh, you have to use say under the Education Act. Um, you're breaching my constitutional rights under um, whatever, Article 42, as a parent. The chances are that you would lose under, our, in a, under the Irish Constitution. Because the Irish Constitution um, and, and those uh, particular areas of the Irish Constitution uh, favour religion and favour the religious majority in the country. That's what the case law that has come out ha has shown that. So the right of, I'll put this, uh, I have a piece of research there from, I don't really ever hear a guy called Professor Jerry White, he's in Trinity, he's on the telly, he's very well known. Um, uh, he has said that the, the case law at the Supreme Court and the various cases, and there's not many of them edu on education because of this whole thing that you can't afford to get to the courts. I mean, it's all right saying you have all these rights, but if you can't, um, have an effective remedy for those rights, and you can't afford to get uh, to get to the courts. The, the right is effectively diminished. You haven't got it. So he has said that the right um, of the religious majority or Catholic parents to have a religious education for their children under the Irish Constitution is greater than the rights of minorities and the non-religious not to be discriminated against. But under human rights law, the right not to uh, um, suffer discrimination is just as great as, as um, parents' uh, uh, right to have uh, religious education for their children. There's, there's no difference. You know, it's the, same. It's, it's, it's the same right. It comes under the right to freedom of conscience. So there's, there's a positive aspect to the right of freedom of conscience and a negative aspect to the right of freedom of conscience. Now, under the positive aspect of the right, parents uh, have a right... Uh, um, to open up schools, religious schools, but they haven't got a right for the state to fund that. There's no right there. There's absolutely no right under human rights law for the state to fund a religious education uh, for any child. It's just not there. The state is obliged to respect all 
uh, religions, reli parents and their philosophical convictions. That's what their right is there. So, but there is a negative aspect to that right. That is a right that you can opt out of a religious education for your children. That you don't, that you have a right as uh, um, parents seeking secular education. It is a philosophical conviction under the right to education at the European Court. This right and the right freedom of conscience. They call it a philosophical conviction. And it is your right to opt your child out of anything under the curriculum that is not taught in an objective, critical and pluralistic manner. And the problem with the Irish Constitution is that that right is not recognised as much as the right under the Irish Constitution uh, for the funding of denominational schools. That's the square. I just make a comment there. I think it's not just the schools. It's even the textbooks that go into the oh, yeah. in different textbooks that she has, you know, this presumption that everybody in the school is Catholic. Now we're in a rural community, we have no option but send her to a Catholic class school. The school she's in has been quite supportive, geography or English yeah. or Irish and it everywhere it's true. Every single book, bar maybe math. You know, mm. it's almost inescapable. Well, the school um, and the Catholic Church has to approve the books. So there's a lot of power there. Uh, on that point, what, what, uh, in, in my experience, what you get from most Catholics is, look, we're the majority. We get the majoritarian yeah. argument all the time. They yeah. don't get the equality thing at all. No. And the same with people in the Department of Education yeah. and government departments. They're, they, they're, they continually come back. Look, uh, if there's 90% Catholics in this country, you know, uh, we can't take care for everybody. Well, do the Irish law, can you actually represent yourself in court? There's a Louise O'Keefe case. Louise O'Keefe uh, and sexual abuse case. Louise took um, the state to um, court, but she lost at the Supreme Court because the state was not responsible for the protection of Louise from sexual abuse in the local state funded primary school. That is because this is the thing the state cedes control to the interests of patron bodies and boards of management. It literally, this is in our republic, it hands over control, so it's not responsible. There are no, um, if you look at that whole area of the sexual abuse and that, there are no statutory guidelines there now. Those guidelines that are in place are not statutory guidelines because you cannot, it is impossible to fire a patron. It's just impossible. So um, Louise has taken her case to the European Court and it's sitting on the Minister for Justice desk at the moment and um, for him to reply to. And the European Court, I am convinced, will find that the state were irresponsible and failed in their duty to protect Louise from sexual abuse in day schools. And if they're responsible under Article 3 of the European Convention for the protection of Louise, in, day, in schools, state-funded private schools in Ireland, then they are responsible for our rights under the right to education. So there's a connection there with all that kind of thing. So um, um, I feel that uh, from doing this job and everything like that and doing submissions and connecting with people in, in different, that there is an awareness on the state now that they're in trouble, that something is coming down the road and uh, um, with Worry Quinn and the forum and patron, she's, she's tried to put in place something now, but they know they're in trouble. And um, all we have to do, the door is open, it's ajar a bit, and we just have to keep pushing. And push now. So, Jane, like, so I have to just simply be quick paraphrase this. Like, the credibility of the church at the moment is, um, mm. as we know, them glorified. Yeah. What? You know, I kind of said, can you, can you explain to me why uh, people, let's say, why they want, they want the Catholic ethos within the school? See, I, I, I think it comes down to, a, it's a fear of the unknown. Yeah. People in general are afraid of what might be there in the future, mm -hmm. what might happen. Even though most rational people you talk to will tell you that the church shouldn't have anything to do with the running of schools in the state. But if you, like, when, when I was a class teacher, I used to regularly ask the children in my class who went to Mass yesterday. I'd ask them on a Monday morning. On average, you were looking at two or three out of maybe 25. 
who would go regularly every Sunday. So what were all the rest of those parents doing on a Sunday? They weren't telling the... They, in my view, they are not Catholics. Cultural Catholics. You know, they're a la carte Catholics. Mm. It suits them. But if you look at communion and confirmation, and this is my own personal view, I actually believe that parents see this as a day out. It's a chance to buy new clothes, have a great day out, yeah. go to the pub, go to the uh, local hotel, spend a bit of money, and let everybody see, you know, we're having a great time. It had, and it's all about the children making money, making hundreds and, in fact, thousands of euro of money. I think most people want to leave things as they are, you know, the status quo or the status quo is just, you know, they don't want to fight. The, you know, we, we, look, we all have lives that are just, you know, kind of crazy at the moment. We have so many things to do. Mm. And I think most parents I would talk to would say, look, you know, I agree with you, but they're not willing to, to take these issues on, you know. And you were talking about a poll there, actually. There was, um, I think, back in June at this forum of patronage, mm -hmm. um, I think Professor Coolahan, who was speaking at it, was asked about um, religion in schools. And he said that, as far as he understood, this was, I think, on the 24th of June, that it would appear the state is prohibited from allowing non-denominational schools. Now, it came out the next day yeah. that the General Secretary General of the Department of Education came out, Bridget McManus, and she said that there was no block yeah. to non-denominational schools. So this, like, there's such... The, I'm, I'm only looking into this recently now, kind of looking into the details, mm. and I find the whole thing so complex. It is, the, you know, you have rights, you don't have rights. You're, you're discriminated, you're not. The bottom line is the church are in total control, effectively, of the education system in this country. They know it. They may know things are coming down the line, but as of now, they know it. The very fact of me even speaking here, if I was to say, I can get fired. No questions asked. I can go to the court in this country. They have the right to fire me because I do not adhere to the ethos of the school. Simple as that. So does every homosexual, lesbian, women and men taking contraception. The church could actually fire every one of those teachers and they wouldn't have a hope of winning their case in, in Irish law. Well, it's, uh, it's, it's well known, actually, in the Catholic Church, and it's only understood that atheists aren't fully human anyway. I mean, Sharon and Buffy O'Connor said that. <laughs> but anyway, sorry. But, but the, the point I wanted to make about what the majority, this majoritarian argument that, that they put up, and what are the actual attitudes of Irish people to uh, religious education? In 2004, before a lot of the abuse scandals broke, uh, St. Patrick's College, there's an educational research unit there, they did a survey of uh, the attitudes of Irish people to education. Uh, it was a large sample, over, over a thousand, so it's very reliable. And there's a clear majority in, the, uh, in that sample, right, in, the, in that survey, who wanted all school, every, all religions to be able to attend the one school in every area, right? and that uh, religious uh, education would, or, or indoctrination would be conducted outside school hours. Right? So even on the majoritarian version that the Ioni Institute uh, come out with, or the uh, majoritarian argument that the Ioni Institute come out with, right? they, they even lose on that. Most Irish people, in fact, want all kids educated together. Um. Do you explain the sorry, someone asked yeah, what, uh, pluralism. To pluralism just to well it's a recognition of different religions and um, non-religious beliefs um, in relation to the Irish education system you might always hear these buzzwords plurality of patronage as far as possible they, they always say that that's been coming down the line for ages now just that means on the ground this is what this means um, we'll have the education school down there, we'll have the Catholic school down there, and um, the as far as possible is for the areas where there's only one school. So that will be us parents, as parents, and all religious minorities will still be attending, children will still be attending the local Catholic school. The as far as possible means human rights as far as possible. 
That's what it means. So that's why in this education area, you have to stick to a rights-based approach because under human rights, um, it is an individual right. Everybody has this right. It's not a right for the religious majority in a particular area because you can't say, well, um, uh, the Catholics down in Cootail and County Cavan have the right to freedom of conscience in there just because they're the majority there. It's this majoritarian argument that they use all the time. But uh, uh, the right to freedom of conscience is for uh, Muslim parents down there. It's for uh, parents that are seeking secular education for, for their children. It is an individual right. And so what they're at this issue now, this plurality of patronage, or Breed O'Brien in the Irish Times a few weeks ago um, spoke of um, atheist uh, parents. They have these rights uh, within constraints. So the within constraints is for us that we don't have this right because we will be in a minority in most areas. So uh, um, within constraints is we don't have those rights in a particular area where there's a majority of Catholics. That's what that means. So when they're using all these buzzwords now by diversity and pluralism and all that, that's what they're at. They're trying to convince you. Uh, we'll give you some schools over um, um, back to the state and uh, um, it'll, it won't mean the same thing. So you'll have, say, in areas of Dublin where there are loads of children going to school, you'll have uh, educate to get a school, uh, um, Catholic school, maybe a Muslim school, but down the road, a few miles down the road, um, you'll only have the local Catholic school. And the uh, um, Muslims and the humanists and the atheists or whatever, uh, and the children of atheist parents will have to go to that school and they still won't have any rights. It'll still be the same. So be very careful over those kind of words. I mean, we're not the only state that uh, has a majority religion in yeah. Europe. Yeah. How about, has any other state got it right in the school education system? Oh, France. <laughs> I think friends, but um, uh, they don't have our system. Our system is unique. You know, um, other countries um, all have uh, um, non-denominational schools. They have a state secular education system. Every uh, country has uh, uh, that. But we, uh, and then in some countries, then even in France, they fund religious schools. And, uh, but you cannot discriminate on entry in French schools. They, there's no equal status act. You know, if a Muslim wants to go to the Catholic school and you're getting funding from the state, you have to let them in. And you can't say, well, we're full up here now. Uh, uh, our Catholics, you have to go somewhere else. They want to go to the school. They have to go to the school. And um, the French state has control of the curriculum. In, um, but down the road and in the same area, you have your non-denominational secular French school. I yeah. thought for nearly 20 years in there's no mention of, um, you know, um, creeds or we have no prayers, we have nothing. Yeah. Uh, it's not denominational, totally. So yeah. if, if Spain, which is a Catholic, Catholic country, yeah. can handle it, why can't it be done here? Because when I when I finished my degree here, I wanted to be a teacher, but I could not go to a training college here in Ireland and didn't force me to have some kind of a Catholic teaching. I wanted to be a primary school teacher, but I could not accept for me that I would have to, um, you know, uh, prepare children for communion or confirmation, something that I personally did, did, didn't believe in. Um, and so in Spain, I could do that. You're taught in, in school not to challenge these things. That's what we have been all taught. But there is a change on the ground because um, I get complaints in from parents all the time and deal with complaints in schools and um, they have different issues. And, with, you know, they're all the same, basically, uh, structure. But, you know, the, the teachers, the things that some of the teachers say to parents, I just cannot believe it sometimes. So I usually give them, uh, get very involved in that, and I give them, uh, tell them what their rights are and everything. Now, it usually involves around opting out of a single class or whatever has gone on. Um, but they never seem to want to challenge ethos or anything like that, the parents. Um, once they get their child not partaking in the religious instruction class. Now, I, I've explained um, the Education Act there. But on the ground, children are being forced into take the religious instruction class. 
They're, be to they're being told on the ground that they must take it and they're being forced into taking it. And um, uh, I deal with those, a lot of those. And on Atheist Ireland has a, a, a site called Teach, Don't Preach. And we have opt out letters on that site that are downloaded and parents then just take that to the school. It gives you section 30 is written into in the letter and a few things like that. And um, we, um, but I have noticed in the last while back um, that they're getting more vocal on the ground. Like they'd ask me a bit, a few more questions. I, I don't like putting pressure on people saying, well, just go in and say this and say that and the other. I just tell them their rights and uh, um, whatever they feel comfortable with doing because it's impossible to push somebody in to something that they don't feel comfortable with doing themselves. But they're doing it, I find. In the, la uh, in the last uh, few months, um, there was one particular complaint and um, she still had them in the religious instruction class, but she decided to um, the parents that she wanted to opt uh, the children out of Holy Communion. And um, she was getting a bit of grief over that. So um, I gave her, told her the rights and what to say and all this kind of thing. So she organized a meeting, went in, listed off her rights and pulled them out of the religious instruction class along with her, as along with Holy Communion. So, and you know, they're just not prepared to put up with it. So I find that people on the ground are starting to speak out an awful lot more. Well, I'm finding it. that primary schools are a very useful way of getting around this mm. is is the, the thing that um, if you want to opt out of the religion instruction mm. class, that they're not obliged to supervise you. Yes, so they it. cannot allow the children leave the classroom yeah. unless there's someone to look after them, yeah. which is a really wily way of ensuring that the children stay in the classroom. Mm. And I mean, things go in, you're not deaf, no matter how engrossed yeah. you get into playing a computer game and stuff. You, the children are going to hear it, mm. and a primary school back home make the children do maths. So they have the option of either mm. sitting in the corner and doing maths, and not many children enjoy maths, or joining in the religion class. Mm. And it, it, they're very wily in their way yeah. of tricking you into, you've no choice but really to do this. Yeah, there's a whole psychology, it's like a psychology on the ground of um, kind of coercion and persuasion, even if they don't say well, some of them are so ignorant, the teachers now, that they'd force um, the children and say, well, you have to do this if you come to this school and all this kind of thing. But then there's this whole other kind of the way the system is all set up and the psychology of it all. Uh, I'll give you one example of um, this. 